We're so fortunate to have Frank Wagner with us today. Um, we are part of the Smithsonian Affiliate Program, and it's through this program that we're able to have Crane here with us tonight. Uh, to kind of lost his face to many parts of the world, um, especially recently, uh, for those of you who probably have seen it on the news, uh, Palmyra certainly being one of those sites, uh, a new program was unveiled in early October, creating a new reserve unit as part of an agreement between the Smithsonian Cultural Resource Initiative and the U.S. Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command at Fort Bragg, uh, which is part of what brings us to tonight's talk. That's why I don't like microphones. Uh, Kareem has served as an officer in the U.S. Army Civil Affairs Corps. Her last assignment was as an Arts, Monuments, and Archives Officer in Iraq. To that end, Korean is responsible for the recovery of items looted beginning in 2003 from the Iraqi National Museum. And for those of you who saw our postcard and poster, uh, the mask that's on there um, is one of those pieces that Korean helped recover. Korean is an art historian and worked as a curator at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts for 13 years. In 2010, Korean served as international project coordinator for the Smithsonian's Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, preserving more than 30,000 objects of Haitian heritage after the 2010 earthquake. In 2012, she became director of the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, an outreach program to train and support cultural heritage professionals, first responders, and the military working in heritage disaster risk management and response. Projects have included assistance for cultural heritage in New York after Hurricane Sandy, and emergency training workshops for cultural heritage professionals from Mali, Iraq, Syria, Nepal, and other countries experiencing disasters. And having had uh, dinner with Korean and being able to talk to her this afternoon, the work that everybody's doing as part of this new reserve unit is absolutely fascinating, and I think you'll enjoy tonight's discussion. So please help me welcome Crane Wagner. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the museum and the university for welcoming me and um, giving me a chance to look around the gorgeous campus today and the fantastic museum. The exhibition that's going up in there right now looks fascinating. I wish I could be here for the opening of that. Um, and also to the Smithsonian affiliates because not only do they help with um, you know, working with programming for museums across the country, all of our affiliates, but they're also really active in helping us with our disaster work whenever disasters strike across the United States, we look to the affiliates to tell us, to reach out to the museums in the area, to let us know whether or not museums have been impacted. And they're, they're kind of the, the tendrils that go out to the larger community to, so that we can learn what other types of cultural heritage has been impacted. So I really thank them as a, as a partner. And there are an increasing number of military museums, I think, who've become uh, affiliates. And so that's really interesting to me, too, because what I am most interested in in all of my disaster work has to do more with the military and their um, understanding of cultural heritage and the impact that it has on communities and countries when that heritage is damaged, and especially in times of armed conflict. So um, my talk tonight is um, Beyond the Monuments Men. So I think a lot of people know a little bit about the Monuments Men from the Monuments Men film back in 2014, the book, and some other books. Um, but today's armed conflicts also require this kind of care. And this is a picture of us doing some training at the Metropolitan Museum of Art a few years ago for a group of Monuments Men. And we kind of have to go beyond that. So, um, and, and this new unit that was just mentioned is part of that, so I'll talk a little bit about that tonight too. But um, first of all, as was mentioned earlier, I'm pretty much an, a sort of geeky art historian working on decorative arts, furniture, silver, ceramics, 
um, and was you know, happily living my life at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, doing fun exhibitions and things like that. It's a fantastic museum if you haven't been. It's in the heart of Minneapolis and an encyclopedic art museum collection, um, one of the best in the country. But all this time working there, I had a secret identity, which was as an Army Reserve officer. I joined the Army Reserves right out of high school. I enlisted back in the long time ago when you could be all you could be and all that good stuff uh, as, as a way to pay for college, but also because my grandfather was in World War II. He never left the United States, but he still had great stories. And we still watched John Wayne movies together on Sundays um, back in Missouri. And so I joined, and then I went through the ROTC program at the University of Nebraska at Omaha and met my husband there. And um, I convinced him to leave the National Guard and come over to the dark side of the Army Reserve. And um, we were both quartermaster officers for a long time. And then in the first Gulf War, we both deployed. And I got stuck counting Patriot missiles in Germany. And when I came home, which was a pretty good tour, my husband was in Saudi Arabia for a year. Um, but when I came home, I said, we're going to do something different. I want to join the Civil Affairs Corps. And he said, what in the heck is that? But I did convince him. And while I was studying political science and art history in my master's programs at the University of Kansas, I discovered the interesting story of the Monuments Men. And so that kind of um, drove me on to try to do more to develop within the branch. I'm like, why don't I hear about this today? Where's the doctrine regarding our responsibilities under the Hague Convention? And so um, after a while of knocking on doors and asking around, uh, I was told, you know, we did this during World War II. This isn't really a thing we have to worry about anymore. So, you know, just, just worry about your own job, and we're not, you know, we're, we don't do training on this. We have a few experts, you're one of them, but we won't worry about it. And then um, along comes 2003 and the invasion of Iraq, and I was concerned about it the whole time, thinking, you know, there's such important cultural heritage sites there, but I'm sure we've got it covered. I, I can understand how, you know, we have no strike lists. And I know that there's a civil affairs command there. Meanwhile, I was set to go to Afghanistan. <clears throat> and um, then one day, I'm sitting on my couch in Minneapolis, and I see on television, I was watching the morning briefings from CENTCOM on a regular basis, and I see this terrible looting of the Iraq Museum. And um, so I started to call around, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm a museum curator. Is there something I can do? And I got the attention of one of my former commanders that I deployed to Bosnia with um, as during the peacekeeping mission with NATO uh, a few years earlier. And by then, he was the commander of all the US Army civil affairs. And he said, yes, we would really like you to come and join the 352nd Civil Affairs Command in progress. Um, please immediately pack your bags. Do not pass go. Come to Fort Bragg, get processed, and we're going to send you straight to Baghdad. And so that's where I found myself sort of in May of 2003, just, just weeks after the looting of the museum and working directly with the staff. Um, and that's not an easy thing, walking in in uniform and saying, hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you, sort of thing, and saying, we understand that what happened is a terrible tragedy for the staff here. I also work at a museum, and so I kind of can understand what you're going through. If this had happened at my museum, I would be devastated. A lot of people, uh, the staff at that museum, had spent their whole lives researching those collections. The, it's the flagship museum for the whole country of Iraq. Everything that's excavated in the country is cataloged there, and then um, um, many times had been returned back to regional museums. And, and this was one of the tragic things, is that during the first Gulf War, many of those regional museums were objects from excavations. And remember, this is you know thousands of year old heritage, and you pretty much can't throw a stone without hitting an archaeological site there. And so many of those museums, though, had been looted during the first Gulf War, and um, you know, by the locals during a period of instability, 
even under Saddam, there were periods of an instability. And so the, um, many of those museums sent their collections to the National Museum in Baghdad for safekeeping, and then they were looted or damaged. So um, I found myself suddenly trying to work with this staff that had a pretty low level of trust in a lot of ways, and to try to convince them, you know, this is civil affairs, we have a duty to help you, and I had only a few people on my team to do that. So um, I wanna talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but first, you can't really tell the story of what happens here without going back to the monuments men and women of World War II. And as we know, the story of World War II, the Nazis had set their sights on looting the cultural patrimony of Europe. Um, Hitler was a disappointed artist. He did not get into art school in Vienna. If the world would be very much different if he had, I think. Um, and so he had set his sights on building his own Führer Museum in Linz, Austria, his hometown. It was gonna be the greatest museum ever and he needed to loot a lot of art in order to get that. And so he set about doing that. Meanwhile, art that didn't suit the taste of the regime of that time was considered degenerate art. And they had exhibitions and burnings and book burnings and destructions. And, the, and then some of it got sold on the market, right? It might have been degenerate. They didn't want it for uh, the Führer Museum or other German museums but they knew it was quite valuable on the international market and they did, um, they sent things to auction, they sent it through shady dealers and they were able to sell a lot of that looted art to get money back in to the Third Reich that they wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. And you see a pattern here, this is the kind of stuff that happens today when cultural heritage goes missing and gets looted by um, bad actors. And then museums of Europe also recognizing the danger that was coming, many of them took the initiative to go ahead and put their collections into storage for safekeeping. This is a gallery in the Louvre. It's so hard if you've been to the Louvre to imagine that they literally cleaned out the galleries and put things in storage all around the outskirts of Paris in various chateaus and storage areas. In Italy, they packed up and, and bricked up and um, evacuated whole collections from museums all across Italy and put them in secret storage locations. And in many cases, this really wasn't the work of the government because what's wrong with that? Governments don't necessarily always like it if the staff, who oftentimes you're working for the Ministry of Culture, part of the government, if those staff show that they don't have confidence that the you know, museums can protect themselves, that the government can protect them, that's a bad thing. So a lot of times this stuff had to be done in secret, right? And then colleagues, uh, military, um, many colleagues working in the cultural heritage field in Europe also had become involved in trying to develop um, protective measures and, and started to make manuals. How do you do this? Um, this one of my colleagues, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Perbrick, who is the head of the new UK uh, Monuments Officer Unit found this um, fabulous guide in one of the collections when he was doing some research and sent me this image of that. Um, but you know, how do you do this kind of work when you're preparing? And this is the uh, British Museum on the right, which was directly hit by several bombs. They had evacuated their collections to various areas on the outskirts outside London and even clear up to the north in Wales. Luckily, but they did have a lot of damage of larger objects that could not be moved. Even here in the United States, especially after what happened with Pearl Harbor, we started to realize the dangers. And museum directors had an emergency meeting in New York at the Metropolitan Museum of Art not long after Pearl Harbor. And they said, what should we be doing to protect American collections? But they also made the decided, the, the really important decision that the museums had to remain open. They had to be available to the public because we were going to war and they wanted those collections to be a respite for Americans and for service people because they wanted them to be able to have access to their culture. And I still think that's, that's a very important decision they made. But on the side, in sort of secret, 
Um, they also evacuated collections. So the National Gallery of Art, which had just opened to the public um, just before World War II, decided to evacuate very quietly sort of, I think, the top 100 of their most important collections. And they put them on a train and they sent them to Biltmore um, uh, out in the, in the uh, mountains of, I think it's North Carolina, right? North Carolina. Um, good work if you can get it. The curators got to go along and live at Biltmore <laughs> uh, through the duration of the war to take care of the collections. And you can still, if you go to Biltmore now, you can see um, the room where they actually gathered all the crates and this room and they have a really nice, uh, at least last time I was there, they had a nice panel about how they housed the collections from the National Gallery of Art. Even the Smithsonian sent some of their most important collections to a facility in the Smoky Mountains and things um, that were considered the national treasures of America went there in order to make sure they were protected in case bombing was ever actually able to reach the East Coast. And so this idea that we needed to help our colleagues in Europe started around this same time. Um, the museum directors of the world, or of the United States, as I said earlier, um, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the National Gallery of Art, the Fogg Museum at Harvard University, all thought, we're leaders in this. We're going to gather the museums together to see what we can do to protect our own collections, but how can we help our colleagues over in Europe? We know that what they're going through, and they'd already been going through this for several years, even before the US entered the war, and so they had been spending a lot of time trying to convince the US government that there needed to be some kind of expertise for the military to understand where these collections were, um, how to map them. Many of them remembered the terrible damage done to cultural collections during World War I. And so over time, they began to be successful at this attempt. The Army wasn't crazy about it, of course. And General Eisenhower said, look, if we're going to do this, if we're going to have these cultural advisors, they're not going to be these guys. They're going to be soldiers, and they're going to be in uniform, and I am going to have command over them. And so that was kind of the, um, the bargain, right? The, the Roberts Commission, which was called the Roberts Commission because one of the um, justices of the Supreme Court was put in charge of the commission by the president. And they would say, okay, these are my, Paul Sachs was a professor. He knew where his former students were serving. Most of these people were already serving in the military in one way or the other, in the infantry, in, in armor, in all these various places, and they needed to find them and pull them together. And that's, that's one of the things that's tough about the Monuments Men movie, because there's a little bit of an impression that all these people were kind of came off the street or came directly out of the museum and joined the military, but several of them were already in the military. Um, and they're not quite as maybe a handsome bunch as George Clooney and Matt Damon and Kate Blanchett, but um, nevertheless, they, they were really important to saving the world's cultural heritage, and especially n nobody more than George Stout. Um, there's a new film about George Stout's life called Stout Hearted, um, put out by an independent um, uh, documentary company. A couple made the film. They're from Iowa, from the same town as George Stout was from. And he was really the father of the science of art conservation, one of the very early experimenters on the way that time and different materials reacted to the weather and to um, conditions within museums. And he also experimented with looking at how uh, bombing would impact museums. He gave people a lot of advice. He had served in World War I, stayed in the Navy Reserve the entire time between the wars. And, and he had this idea that, of what they could do. He was working at Harvard University. He was working with Paul Sachs to try and figure out how could we create these monuments units that could go in with the divisions as they move forward and try to um, protect sites. Um, and he felt like he wasn't being listened to and that it was never going to happen. So he went ahead and joined at um, 40 plus years old. He went and said that to the Navy, take me, put me wherever you want to. And so he was testing paint, um, methods of painting ships um, here in the United States when he finally got the call, okay, we're going to do this Monuments Men thing. 
James Rormer from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was serving as an infantry officer when they came and pulled him out. Um, he later went on to become uh, director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art for several years. Um, people like uh, Paul Gardner, this guy was no spring chicken and he enlisted in the military um, in order to help them with the Monuments Men program. Um, and uh, Lawrence Sickman, U.S. Army, I love that he was a curator of Chinese art and he helped a lot with um, the Pacific campaign and information about saving cultural sites there. So what do they do? Well, meanwhile, back home, organizations like the American College of Learned Societies, ACLS, which still exists today, I actually have an ACLS fellow working in my office, and um, working with the Frick Museum, Harvard University, and Yale University, and other groups, created maps so that pilots would understand as they were flying their missions where these places were located. And it wasn't always that successful. If you remember the movie, there's a moment where um, Matt Damon says, so you're, you're asking me to go be in a unit where we tell guys what not to hit. It's like basically, yeah, that's it. Um, it wasn't always easy, but they made these fantastic guides. And this one is from the collection at the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian. They have actually a quite large collection of monuments men, memorabilia, especially from Stout and from uh, several of, actually like six or seven of the monuments men gave their papers to the Smithsonian. And this, this is actually a quite oversized folio of maps of France that they could use during the invasion. They also did direct assistance missions as in the wake of actual um, military activity in the towns as they were going through Italy, going through France, the Monuments Men would come along and try to find, do damage assessment reports. They um, went to the local authorities, asked where they could help, and this is an evacuation of a really important religious sculpture from a church in France. They also had the tough job of telling um, military where they could be and where they couldn't be. It's, it's so inviting to go and have your billets in a palace or a castle um, when really, in order to protect these places, they should not be used for a military purpose. And plus, soldiers and Marines are kind of messy and they have a tendency to, to uh, maybe leave things not as nice as when they got there. So they had the responsibility for putting up these out of bounds, off limit signs all over the place. But luckily they had the backing of the Supreme Allied Commander right there at the bottom of the page. Most of the time it worked. And then they also had the really difficult mission. After the fighting was over, they were left with these um, caches of art that the Nazis had looted, plus German art from German museums legitimately stored in these um, salt mines and, and warehouses that needed to be protected so that they could be restituted back to their places of origin. So not only did they need to protect German art, they needed to find the art that had been looted from countries all around Europe and try to get it back to the country of origin. We're still working on this today, right? Museums are still researching the collections that they've acquired since World War II. We have an ethical guideline that says we have to do provenance research on our collections to see if they might have belonged to a family who lost them through looting or through forced sales and things like this. So this is an issue and it's still impacting museums today. And this is Eisenhower. Bradley, Patton, uh, all the generals are discovering these um, paintings stored in a salt mine. This is the very same day that they, for the first time, visited a concentration camp that had been liberated. So um, Eisenhower and the generals had a very tough day that day. Um, and learning that they had hundreds of thousands of objects that needed to be done. And all of the monuments men and women from all the allies were less than about 300 people in a war that included millions and millions of people. This is a Durer portfolio down in a salt mine. A Rembrandt. Um, this is some of the German art stored, and if uh, some of, well, it's not a very good picture, but some of you might recognize Neuschwanstein Castle in the background, and this is where a lot of the, in the movie, um, Rose Valland, Kate Blanchett, tells James Romer 
This is where the Nazis had stored the, the French art that they stole. So lots of art from French collections were stored here. <clears throat> and James Rorimer's job was to bring it back to France. And so we have um, Monuments Men restituting, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of course I didn't bring my water, um, restituting these works of art to countries around the world. And then it was the responsibility of those countries to find out, to, to send them back to their true owners. Thank you, Joe. And we can go to Krakow today, to Poland, to see Leonardo da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine because it was restituted back to its country of origin then. So it's really exciting when you work in museums, and especially around the time of the Monuments Men movie, a lot of museums who had a lot of provenance research that they could share with the public on their collections, because what would often happen is that these families would get this work of art back, and then they would legitimately sell it back onto the market to get the money, because they needed the money. And then, you know, wealthy Americans would go to Europe in the 50s and 60s and purchase it. And then it legitimately later got given to a museum. And so museums that have done their homework have this amazing history or provenance of the ownership of that object that they can share. And it's really exciting the first time you turn around a painting and you see, you know, the swastika painted on the back and you go, wow, this was looted, it was returned and then it was sold through the market to become on the wall of this museum. And I think it's really important that museums try to tell those stories. Why is this object here? How did we acquire it? So what, what lesson did that teach us? What did World War II teach us? Well, there were already rules against the pillaging of cultural property and against the intentional destruction of civilian property, which also includes cultural property. But it seemed as though it was not strong enough, and it was basically part of the, the big law of war, like the Hague Conventions of, 19, of 1899 and 1907. So in the 50s, drawing on the lessons of World War II and the successes of the monuments men and women of World War II, who, by the way, kept working on that restitution until the 1950s, some people, worked on that until about 1953. Um, so the countries of the world got together and they decided to create a new law of war treaty, the 1954 Hague Convention. And I'm, I'm not gonna bore you too much with reading all this out loud, but basically the Hague Convention defines what is cultural property and goes through, you know, basically everything you can think of, museums and their contents, libraries, archives, scientific collections, which sometimes we forget, um, and any kind of repository where this, this type of material is gathered together and saved. It also sets out some guidelines for how to protect cultural property. And the, the really important one, I think, because it applies to both the civilian world, museums and cultural heritage caretakers, and the military is that we have to prepare during peacetime to protect cultural property in, if there's a possibility of war. And each country is left to their own determination of how they do this, um, but it means that we have to make plans for emergencies and all kinds of disasters, including the possibility of armed conflict, even in countries like the United States or France or Germany, because it, it's possible that it could happen, or terrorist attacks are very similar. The kind of protective measures you take will be similar. And um, the Article 4 is that we'll respect the cultural property of other countries, and we'll refrain from using cultural property for a military purpose. It might seem like a great idea to build a military base close to a cultural site, or you might not have a choice because it's in the center of the city and some things are military in these city centers. But as much as possible, you refrain from using it for a military purpose. And then um, there, there is an out. It's, this protection is not absolute. There's a military necessity exception, which I think is really important when you're trying to work with the military because you, no one would ever say you have to send uh, soldiers to their death in order pr to protect a cultural site. If, if that site, and this is what Eisenhower said to his commanders, if 
your, you know, your men's lives are infinitely more important and if the cultural site has to go, it has to go. But make that decision with an informed mind and it better not be for your convenience. Let it not mask laxness or, in, or convenience. So, and then we also have to prohibit and prevent theft, pillage, or misappropriation from our own troops, hence the, you know, off-limit signs and things like that, and training, right? So, and then it's also absolutely prohibited, and this is an absolute, um, that you can't have reprisals against cultural property. You hit me and kill a bunch of my guys, so I go blow up your museum. That's absolutely prohibited under the Hague Convention. And then finally, military measures, which is a little bit of what I want to talk about the Monuments Men, is that um, we're supposed to, each country, and there's more than 100 and 130 countries now that are, are um, part of the Hague Convention, we agree that we'll train our own military and have military regulations to inform them about the things I just said, that we agreed we won't strike cultural property without a military necessity, etc. And the Monuments Men are enshrined really in this second paragraph that we will plan or establish within the armed forces services or specialist personnel whose purpose is to secure respect for cultural property and to cooperate with the civilian authorities responsible for safeguarding it. Because if you read the notes from those conferences that created the Hague Convention, they said, hey, this worked. We had people in uniform sitting around the table during staff meetings. They weren't excluded and left out. And they were able to assert, you know, these are the things that need to be protected and this will benefit us if we do it. The Hague Convention also created the international symbol for cultural property protection, the blue shield symbol. And here you see it used in a couple different places. This left one is on the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, Austria. And the one on the right is on the roof of the Iraq National Museum back in 2003. Um, so the, the symbol is an international symbol, and the Geneva and Hague Conventions go together as the law of war. So the blue shield is to the Hague Convention what the Red Cross is to the Geneva Conventions. So um, for the Iraq Museum, it's like, okay, we have a treaty, 1954 Hague Convention. What happened? We had things happen like the, the intentional destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas the intentional destruction of cultural sites in Bosnia during the Bosnian conflict. Literally places in Bosnia that were marked with the blue shield symbol were deliberately sought out by Serb forces, targeted with main tank guns and pulverized to the ground. So they literally used the blue shield as a target. What happened? Why, you know, why is this, why does this continue to happen? And, you know, fast forward to the looting of the Iraq Museum, and here we are. We've got an armed conflict with um, instability. You have a lot of um, angry people seeing maybe some of these cultural sites as part of the Iraqi government, as part of Saddam's stuff, not our stuff. You have you know, opportunist bad actors who think, oh, if I ever get a chance to loot that museum, my sister used to work there, or you know, what have you. People with insider information. It's how museums often lose things. It's usually some kind of form of somebody who knew their way around. Um, and so this was the, the case at the Iraq Museum as well. So we had a lot of damaged material. We had a lot of missing material. Thousands of objects, no recent inventories because the museum had been under sanctions for many years and completely closed to the public, which also added to that feeling of people saying, this isn't my heritage, I've never been to this museum. And this, you know, deer in the headlights major here trying to figure it all out. And this was the grand sum total of the monuments people <laughs> that we had with us. We had a, a larger team, but none of them had any museum or cultural property background other than um, Captain Wes Sumner, who was a landscape archaeologist, and he got pulled away to help the Iraq Zoo because we had lots of damage to the animals there. Um, animals were dying. He was working with the nonprofit organizations to save the animals, and so I stuck with working at the museum. And this is us on one of our missions to find cultural materials that were stored at the National Bank. So working with the staff and the MPs, we had a lot of returns. We also got 
um, captures of a lot of fake material. Um, but little by little, many thousands of objects came back over time, but it's still a drop in the bucket to what was lost, which was about 15,000 objects is our best bet. Um, there was a lot of working with the international community and with the coalition. So who was in charge of the Ministry of Culture as part of the coalition provisional authority? The Italians, because the Italians are good at culture, right? So my boss was an Italian ambassador. He um, was an Arab specialist and spoke fluent Arabic, which was handy, but he was not a museum specialist. And we had our days of, of argumentation over what the what the mission should be to try to help the Ministry of Culture as a whole, and also to try to help the museum. And then the guy on the right, it was a Carabinieri officer, so they have a special military police called the um, Carabinieri for the Protection of Cultural Patrimony. And so we always had a few Carabinieri f around, and they said, well, Corey, of course you, your country failed to protect the cultural patrimony because you're, you're so young, you're so cute. Aren't you so young? You can just see the ambassador patting me on the head, can't you, um, practically? And, um, and you've never ratified the 1954 Hague Convention. I was like, what? What do you mean? And I, I thought, of all people who should know about this, how did I not know this? This just stunned me. And um, so I started asking around about that. Meanwhile, we had lots of projects to busy us. This is the, tr the famous treasure of Nimrud, um, one of the most important gold, treasures of gold and um, ancient Mesopotamian artifacts in the world. It's right up there with King Tutankhamun's treasure. Um, that was found safe and sound in the bank vault and we had a whole series of events that we had to do to repatriate that stuff to go back to the museum and to be documented and inventoried, but you, it's just an unimaginable thing, and I've been really fortunate to work with colleagues trying to do the recovery at the archaeological site of Nimrud, and you know that it's never been really fully excavated. So, um, working on the Iraqi Jewish archive recovery, that material came back to the United States to be preserved, and it's been on an exhibition tour ever since. It is. Parts of it are um, planned to be returned to Iraq. There's a whole negotiation going on about that now. But if we hadn't um, brought them back to the US and freeze dried them, they would have been destroyed forever because they were um, found underwater in the secret police headquarters in Baghdad. And most of the material was organic paper and skin and um, Torah scrolls and things like that. So, so and, and I guess I, sh I wanna go back and say, if I look like a deer in the headlights there, it's because I am. I'm thinking, how can I do something when I get home to try to help the Army, to help civil affairs, and to help the rest of our cultural heritage community not have this happen again? What can we do? And plus, can we ratify the Hague Convention? So I found out there was an organization called the Blue Shield, which supports the Hague Convention much in the way the International Committee of the Red Cross supports um, the Geneva Conventions. And so we created our own U.S. committee, and a lot of people helped do that, um, the archaeological community, the museums, the archives, the libraries, we all came together, because you have to apply to have the international status of a committee. And we set our first goal of getting the United States to ratify the Hague Convention. We found out that, or I found out, um, that we had helped draft it back in 1954, but the Senate never ratified it. The President never sent it to the Senate to be ratified, because we couldn't agree. It was the Cold War, the Department of Defense didn't want to do it, so this is what we ended up doing. And uh, we, we, we um, started working on the lobbying effort to do this. This was before I worked for the government. And we worked really hard to talk to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about the benefits of ratifying the convention. I would like not to be in a situation where we're, we're in a coalition and our coalition partners have all ratified the treaty and we haven't, and there was a lot of finger pointing. The British also had not ratified and there was a lot of political turmoil in the UK over the looting of the Iraq Museum and damage to sites. And so our argument was, look, this will make things easier when you're in a coalition and you're all part of the same law of war treaties. 
you can have the same rules of engagement, et cetera. So we finally um, convinced everyone, including the Department of Defense and the State Department, and in September 2008, the Senate voted yes to ratify, and the President sent the treaty to UNESCO, which is where the, the treaty is administered in 2009. So um, I came to the Smithsonian not too long after that, because in 2010, we didn't get to rest on our laurels very long. In 2010, we had the Haiti earthquake. And as was mentioned earlier, that's kind of where Smithsonian got very involved in disaster risk management and disaster response for museums and other cultural heritage. So the Blue Shield and, cultural, and the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, both of whom I've worked for, banded together and said, we're going to do more to train militaries, and especially Army Civil Affairs, because it makes sense. They still have the doctrine, they still have the positions, but they don't have very many people. In today's all-volunteer force, you don't find very many art historians who say, I want to join the Army. So we have to grow our own, right? We have to train those folks, and then we'll, we'll look around in the Army and see who else might be interested in joining us for this task. So we trained everywhere from fancy places like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, who have these amazing collections of Iraqi material. This unit was getting ready to deploy to Iraq. And I have given talks in the supply room of Army Reserve units. You see me surrounded by boxes of MREs there. Um, and I will talk to anybody who will listen, even if it's you know two guys sitting there with cleaning their M16s, I will talk to them about the Hague Convention while they do it. <laughs> Um, and what are we trying to, what do they need to know? What do, what is beyond monuments meant? Well, we're no longer in these conventional force on force conflicts. We are in an era of persistent conflict and we are dealing with a lot of armed non-state actors. And contrary to popular belief, the law of war also applies to armed non-state actors. They don't have a government to make them do things and to punish them if they do it wrong but they, they are subject to the treaties and to the laws of war. Um, so we see all of a sudden, starting around 2011, 12, 13, we see all these armed non-state actors, um, Islamic extremists making moves against cultural heritage sites in Mali, in Syria, the destruction of Palmyra, and many other sites in, in Syria. Um, the, the Nimrud archaeological site that I mentioned, where that beautiful treasure's from, was one of the most complete ancient cities in the world, and especially for the Neo-Assyrian era in Iraq. This was the capital of the world at one time, blown up, destroyed. And this is what we have today. We're working, as I said, to try to salvage these pieces so that we can help the Iraqis put it back together. The Mosul Museum, very near and dear to my heart, I'm leading a project to help Iraqis with the salvage there. And it wasn't just the smashing up of statues, they used high explosives everywhere inside the building. Most of the movable objects had been evacuated to the Baghdad Museum, as I said, back in 2003. And those are intact, nobody looted those objects that were stored there. But um, the things that couldn't be moved, really monumental sculptures, they literally used explosives to blow them into pieces. So we're working on that. That hole in the floor is about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. But the good news is we went there with engineers and um, tested everything and the museum can be renovated. So we're excited to work with them. And then just this idea of working to raise awareness Cultural heritage professionals need to know more about what the military can do and how to train them. And I teach classes on that to the cultural heritage community and I also teach the military. And what we need to do is not preach, right? We need to give them a mission-based rationale for what they do. Yes, clear down here at the bottom, I say it's required. But that's not the best argument. Starting at the top, letting military personnel understand how the cultural heritage is tied to the human environment that they're working in and can be um, really important to understanding how not to lose the mission, how not to have the population of Baghdad turn against you because there's instability and they're seeing their heritage get damaged and looted, etc. These are really important lessons that we need to keep 
talking about over and over because it does keep happening over and over through history. Um, it supports governance, right? We don't have a ministry of culture here, but most other countries do, and we kind of ignored that. Oh, we have to staff a ministry of culture? Wait, we don't have that, and we don't understand why it's so top-down and bureaucratic. Don't museums just have rich donors, and that's how they work? And I'm like, well, most other countries don't do it that way. So um, avoid damaging PR. What you don't want to see is, oh, the, the ancient site of Babylon, home to most you know, religions in the world know about Babylon, right? We damaged it by building a helicopter landing pad on it and driving heavy trucks over um, fired brick walls, ancient walls. So you don't really want that. You want that positive narrative. We protect civilians and their property. The bad guys, those ISIS guys, they're the ones who destroy. And providing them great information like this as you're building these no strike lists and helping them to understand this is the modern day equi equivalent of that France um, document that I showed you earlier, right? We have, we have these maps, but now we have a really high-tech way of translating, transmitting this information. And the Smithsonian and the Blue Shield and many universities have happily worked with colleagues at the Defense Intelligence Agency to make sure that they have their coordinates right and that they share this with coalition allies. Um, more recently, when there was this controversy over talking about Iranian sites, that relationship became very strained. Universities want to believe that their data is going to be used in a positive way to support the law of war and the hate convention. So this is something we're going to have to talk about some more in the coming days. But you know, this is the kind of information that I think is important for civil affairs teams to have on the ground and use to inform their command. Um, we created some just-in-time materials for the retaking of Mosul to give information. These are little pocket handbooks, um, uh, also for Raqqa and Deir Ezzor, and they were used. And then training, training, training. So this is at the National Museum of American History. Um, this is at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And we've done several of these over the years. So this, in, in a way, and these are Marines. We even train Marines. Um, <laughs> And natural history specimens. I don't know anything about preserving natural history specimens, but my colleagues over at the National Museum of Natural History do, and I saw a lot of these Marines' eyes light up because they can relate to this a lot more than they could relate to maybe the paintings. And then teaching them about their own history. As I said, the Archives of American Art has a lot of collections related to the World War II monuments men. Um, they did an exhibition at the time of the movie, and that's George Stout there and the great big picture in the background. But we wanted to give them the, the real picture of the real monuments, men and women. And to teach them about who came before, this is Harry Etlinger that you saw in this, with this picture of Rembrandt. Harry, unfortunately, left us, passed away a couple years ago, and I miss him very much. But um, boy, that guy could tell a story. Um, and then teaching them about the new experts that they have. Um, this is Scott DeJesse, and we, we were fortunate to get some interest when the Smithsonian signed the Memorandum of Understanding with use of KPOC, the US Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command, because they want to strengthen this um, career field that they're responsible for, and they're responsible by doctrine for having people, like the Hague Convention says, who can give information to the rest of the force, to the commanders on the ground, and to work with the stakeholders. And so Scott is that guy. He is the modern day monuments man. Um, he's an artist. He has a museum background. Uh, he uh, teaches at Texas Tech University Museum Program. And he's really sort of, I, I tease him that he's the face of civil affairs now. He's the new George Clooney. Um, so he and I are working together. We have a big, uh, program coming up next month to do a week-long training for the 38 Golfs. And what the heck is a 38 Golf? Well, it's the new program. It's not really, somebody said earlier it's a new unit, and I would s sort of say these are units that already exist, but they're um, strengthening the program whereby they find uh, experts in their various fields, and cultural heritage is only one of the fields, 
And we're gonna be training cultural heritage experts. We're gonna have about 25 people come from, um, most of them are civil affairs already. Some of them are going before a board tomorrow to try to get a direct commission because they have uh, education and civilian experience, their civilian jobs qualify them to join Army Civil Affairs. Um, and this training will be interdisciplinary across the Smithsonian. It'll be some of it military. Some of it'll be really basic stuff like how to hold an object because maybe not everybody has that background. Maybe they're an archivist and I'm gonna teach them how to hold an antique chair. Um, and they're gonna teach each other because they're all experts in some area of cultural property. But um, this is my moment when I hope um, the, the cadets are listening and thinking about their branches that they wanna go into in the military. And I wanna put my hat on, I'm also on the board of the Army Civil Affairs Association. And I wanna put forth my pitch for why you should become a civil affairs officer. Now, you may have to wait a little while because it's a non-accession branch. You have to branch another branch first, whether it's infantry or quartermaster or what have you. But then um, as, as a captain, you can join civil affairs. The um, 38 golfs, which are these civil affairs experts, focus on governance. So they're every kind of specialization that you would need if you were going to be an occupation force or a governance or provide advice on the civilian community. There are people like JAG officers and engineers and infrastructure experts and everything you would need um, if you were doing governance. And um, they provide unique training experiences, like coming to the Smithsonian to train, but they're also working with corporations, other public-private partners, academic institutions, because they wanna provide um, experiences for more than just the cultural heritage, but for other parts of, their, um, of the 38 Gulf um, new civil affairs expert uh, MOS career specialty. So um, that's my pitch. Uh, any cadet who's interested in talking more about this, uh, I hope you'll contact me. I'm uh, at the Smithsonian, WegenerC at si.edu, and um, I'll put you in touch with this guy, <laughs> the face of Army Civil Affairs. So that's my talk. Thank you very much for coming out on such a cold night, and um, if anybody's listening at home, uh, thank you for listening at home. If we have time, I'm happy to take a couple questions. Yeah, sir. What was your reaction to the President's apparent intent to ignore the hate convention uh, by uh, doing revenge bombings in Iraq? Sigh. <laughs> um, I, I, I wasn't too worried because I've been working, I was in the military for 21 years. I've been working with the military, advising civil affairs, doing training for another 17 years after my retirement. So I know that the experts know what they're supposed to do and how they support the law of war. So, um, but, and then my next reaction was, there's gonna be a lot of media attention about this. And so over the next 48 hours, I think everybody in the country heard something about the Hague Convention, and I was very happy about that. So um, it got a lot of people thinking about it and um, wanting to talk about the topic of how you protect heritage in war, so I was happy about that. Was the military been obliged to carry out his orders? No. Uh, because they were in fact violating the law? You, um, under the law of war, you can refuse an illegal order. Now, there would have to be a lot in between of discussion uh, with leadership and everything, but I don't think they would be obliged. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, um, I teach uh, in the Army ROTC department, and uh, I actually get a lot of questions about civil affairs from the uh, cadets, one of which is, um, to go into civil affairs, obviously they're not, you know, it's not non-accession, mm -hmm. but is there anything that civil affairs looks for in a branch that they would, you know, ascend into that looks more favorable for them to go into civil affairs? Yeah, um, I think, so I, when I first came into civil affairs, I was studying political science, 
And so that's a field, um, all kinds of, my, my husband in civil affairs was a logistics expert because um, he, in his civilian job, was a food logistics broker. And so um, in, in all these kind of civilian occupations, what, what civil affairs is looking for is somebody who does this in their civilian job and they're really good at it and they're sort of um, working in the field. It, it's not enough to just have the degree, et cetera, and that's why it's a non-accession branch, right? They want you to get out there, get the experience of going um, in another branch, and then also it's all in the reserve. All these 38 golf positions, there's about 400 of them. They're all in the reserves and they're spread across reserve units all across the United States. And as um, you may not know, civil affairs doesn't really deploy by itself. It deploys being attached onto combatant commands. So um, like a civil affairs command will deploy um, with it at, you know, up at the division and higher. And, and then the, the brigades go along with, or battalions go along with brigades, et cetera. So they attach on to other units and they serve as the G5 S5. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yes, sir. Uh, just in thinking about how you plan and how in civil affairs you might want to pre-position expertise uh, in possible areas of conflict. Is that, is that something that is considered certain sort of areas of the world where cultural heritage is really quite important, uh, either in the East or the Mideast or other areas where there might be a conflict? I, well, again, civil affairs would not deploy people by themselves. They will go they'll be assigned to a command. So I think, I think the idea is more that they'll be in planning cells at the comms, at the CENTCOM, SOUTHCOM, UCOM, et cetera, and be able to, and, but be aware there are only going to be about 20 of these cultural heritage professionals. So the idea is that the civil affairs, the, the whole force knows something that they're supposed to protect cultural heritage and armed conflict. And then the civil affairs people that are in that G5, S5 know more. And they may not be an expert, but they know who to call. And then if there is an actual um, military operation uh, going on, that they can bring somebody forward with the expertise they need. And this is the key to this new program is they're vetting and boarding people so they know exactly what their expertise is. For, I mean, to be fair, Lisa k -Pak knew I was some kind of museum person, but that was about it. And they're like, go, go, go. Now they're, gonna, they're being much more careful, understanding people's expertise and hoping to deploy the right person to the right place at the right time. I think I'm quoting Major General Guthrie, the head of Lisa k -Pak, just now. I didn't mean to, but I think I was. Yeah. Can you tell the story that we told on the radio this morning about recovering that bed? Oh. <laughs> Are you my interviewer? <laughs> okay. Um, so the work ahead, I didn't show a picture of it here, but it's on the posters for the talk tonight. And it was just that it, it's one of the most important objects at the Iraq National Museum. It's thousands of years old. It's the earliest known representation of a female face. In, in history, it's in all the art history 101 textbooks if you go just about anywhere. And um, it was, that was the number one object. We had posters all over Baghdad looking for missing objects, trying to get people, because a lot of people took things in order to protect them as well, and they did bring them back. They're like, oh, I heard it's safe to bring things back. Well, this didn't come back. And so through a series of raids that the military police did in cooperation with the Iraqi police, et cetera, they were able to get a rumor that the work ahead um, had been taken and that was being hidden, um, buried in a, I think it was at a farm. And um, so they recovered it and I got a phone call one day in the palace, my office was in the big palace of the foreheads in the green zone. And this guy says, hey, I'm Captain Vance Cooner, I'm the head of an MP unit and we think we found that head of work a thing. And I go, you mean the head of Orca, the lady of Orca, you found it? Where is it? Is it okay? Is it safe? And he's like, oh, so it's pretty important, huh? And I said, uh, yeah, it's like one of the most important collections objects in the world. 
And he said, oh, okay, well, I'll tell the boys to quit throwing it around out back like a football. <laughs> and I was like, uh, uh, and he goes, relax, ma'am, I'm kidding, it's in the safe, and I'm just calling to make an appointment to bring it back. <laughs> So that's the, that's the story, and it, and of course it was really remarkable recovery. We had a whole press conference about it to to show the world that it was safe. Any other questions? Over here. It seems overwhelming to me looking at this. When you go into these this, these museums and these damaged places, in summary, what is the protocol? You're going room by room. You're, you're picking and choosing as you go. How do you even have a sense of <clears throat> order and, and trying to get all the pieces of these together? To me, it's just it's inconceivable that you can do this. Well, like, like any other overwhelming project, you eat the elephant one bite at a time. And I'm lucky to not have had to figure this out by myself. Obviously, I'm, I'm a follower of conservators who have been figuring this out for years, but I particularly worked, um, when I started working on this, clear back in 2003, I met an amazing woman named Aparna Tandon at the International Conservation Center in Rome. And I, actually, she w hadn't even gone to work there yet, but I met her at a conference about protecting cultural heritage. And um, she said, we've got to have some kind of procedure, some kind of really clear guidelines on how you do salvage for these damaged places. And she's from Kashmir, right? So she's been experiencing armed conflict her whole life. And she's a conservator. She trained at Harvard and has, has been all over the world. So we started working on a program called First Aid for Cultural Heritage in Times of Conflict. And she helped develop a, a protocol. And it's not hard, it's not rocket science, but it's basically treating one of these really damaged sites or museums like an archeological site. And you make a grid and you record everything very carefully. When we went to the Mosul Museum, we had to be very careful because we knew it was a crime scene. This is a, a law of war violation, it's a war crime. And so before we start picking pieces up, we needed to be very careful that we document everything the way we saw it, even knowing a lot of people had been through there, reporters, etc., and saving that documentation for the Iraqis if they should decide to have a war crimes tribunal. And if, what, because once you screw that up, you can't go back. And so we did training with the FBI to learn how to do evidence collection, um, and that's a whole nother lecture. But um, it's my passion right now, and we're going to be doing some more training with them to try to teach more heritage professionals who are in those situations, because everybody's afraid to touch things. It's like, what am I going to screw up? How can I do this? Meanwhile, you wait. Well, we don't want people to have to wait. We want, we want both. We want the evidence that can last 10 years till there's a tribunal, and we want to save things now. So that's how you do it, one little bit at a time. Well, I think that um, wraps it. Thanks very much again for all your good questions and for coming out tonight. <laughs>